welcome to the next edition of the OpenShift Operator Hours show. So today we're lucky enough to have with us uh, Trilio, and we are going to be talking with Morali Balcha, who's the founder and chief technology officer of the company, as well as Prashanto Kochavara, who's the director of product. So welcome, gentlemen. Welcome to the TV show today. Thank you, Michael. And um, a founder's story. I believe we were going to talk about a founder's story. What can you tell us about that? Thanks, Mike, for the introduction. No problem. Um, hey, it's in these, you know, I, I, I'm going to make a, I'm, last night, Cyrus Champy and I decided we were going to make a round of t-shirts for everybody. And one of them is going to say, can you see my screen? And then the other shirt is going to say, hey, Audio. you're on mute. And so everybody can be wearing these. And if someone is that, we can all just start pointing at our shirts, you know? That'll be one of the best sellers. Yeah. So welcome, uh, welcome, Morali. A, a founder's story. Uh, you founded Trilio. Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. So I founded Trilio in 2013. It almost feels like eons back. Um, so before that, I was at EMC. I spent almost 15, 16 years at EMC. Um, EMC, we know it's um, a pioneer in storage area networks. They single-handedly invented the stories. Um, I was part of that journey. I think I was fortunate enough to basically work, get to work on almost every storage area technologies that uh, that is there. Um, so when EMC bought uh, VMware, um, I was leading uh, the integration of virtualization uh, with uh, EMC technologies. And uh, again, back in, in 2012, 2011, when uh, cloud was still at the inception, right? And, um, you know, the Amazon AWS was probably the only public cloud out there. Um, and the shape and nature of the cloud is still up in the air to define. Um, so every vendor was trying to figure out what they can do in the cloud and uh, how they can play in the cloud. Uh, we are looking at various technologies that EMC has and how they play in the cloud paradigm. So looking at the data protection, um, and then I suddenly realized like most of these um, these products they were there since 1980s when tape was the predominant backup medium. And uh, they haven't re really evolved much uh, since then. I think um, they still have client server architecture and they back up um, lots of files. Um, and it is administered by one central administration. Uh, and uh, so it wasn't really meant for cloud. So it, uh, cloud is a different paradigm. Um, it was appending everything that we know about the IT. Um, and uh, we thought like we need a, a completely new thinking around the data protection. And uh, there's the reason led me to basically come and found uh, Trilio in 2013. And what's and what's in the name? I mean, we have ah. we have lots of we have lots of partners. You know, we I have th probably 1,200 software vendors that I work with on a on a daily, weekly basis. You know, I I, I do marketing activities with our partners once they've certified their software, and we're going to get to that in a little minute about your your support for OpenShift. But you know. Uh, names of bugs, uh, uh, you know, ro rocket, you know, names of rockets, and you know, what, what's, what's, why, what, why Trilio? Yeah, why Trilio? So I, I think uh, what I realized was coming up with the name is one of the, one of the challenging thing. <laughs> right. um, we tried various things, um, and then we realized, well, we are three founders. Uh, we kind of came together with some passion. Um, it takes kind of lines here to basically come and start a startup company. So we thought three lines, so it's kind of rhymed with a trillio. So we went with that. <laughs> um, well, you know, and, and there, it's even way more than that. I mean, I, I've been here, actually, today is my 20th anniversary at Red Hat. I just found out. I, oh, I had all these people, I had all these people like messaging me on LinkedIn this morning and I couldn't figure out why. <laughs> um, but Having been here at Red Hat for 20 years now, which I learned today, 
I've dealt a lot with brand and marketing over the years around logos and new product creation and so forth. And, you know, when you make a name, it has a big ripple effect on, on everything else from a brand perspective about the naming of the products and Absolutely. all the way down to like trying to put a logo on a baseball cap. You know, if your yeah. if your logo is like this, it makes it really challenging to do branding with other companies. So I, I don't know. I, I just thought I'd bring that up. Um, anyway, so founding the company was smooth sailing. You, you, you got a little bootstrap capital and then everything just went perfectly as planned or what? Uh, absolutely. No, no hiccups, nothing. It was a straight <laughs> drag race. No, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't that, um, you know, I, I think we, you know, every startup company has some challenges, some, you know, hitting that mark with the business case, right? Um, some some companies can do much better. I think partly they are lucky and partly they probably read the market very well. Um, but a lot of other companies, I think they they have some winding path, like they, some trial and error methods until um, they get the act together, right? Um, we know we have a big uh, a, a big opportunity here um, in the cloud. Uh, cloud is going to be the next biggest thing back in 2012-13, right? Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, the hype that we had at the time when we left the company and start and then kind of exploring, um, and talking to a lot of companies, um, it didn't really match with the, with the reality, right? Every company wants to do something in the cloud. They want to basically reorganize their IT into the cloud paradigm, but reality is different. Uh, right, they still have the older uh, business processes in place. They use the old technologies. Um, <clears throat> so it was a bit of a surprise for us, like, you know, the high process reality. And uh, and we, um, in initial few years, it's, it's a bit of a struggle to find these customers who are looking for a product um, in, in the backup space. And the on top of it, especially with the backup, backup is not a day one problem, right? They need to first uh, deploy the applications in the production. They need to run in the production for a few days before they realize they need they need a backup. So it's a day two problem. So that also exa exasperated our um, ability to succeed in the marketplace. But it almost like took three years for us to land our first customer. Years, wow. And, and Trulio Vault for data protection. Um, it's it's a cloud native. Is it, it's built on Kubernetes for Kubernetes. How is that? Why does the world need another data protection solution? I mean, I, I I've been around you know as as, as long as dirt, and uh, you know back in the day when I was a digital equipment corporation, there were great backups pieces of software, and mm -hmm. you know they've the, you know we all know the names of them, but how come people just don't use something that's that's been around and, and has been well, well, well uh, manicured for the last 20 years. Why, you know, why do they need something new? Yeah. Well, it's IT, right? It, it, it requires constant innovation. Um, the, I, I think, um, you know, most of the backup systems that they develop, they are very much detached from the platform they are protecting, right? It was okay. Um, in the Windows, uh, Linux, bunch of Linux servers. Um, but uh, I think when you look at uh, the cloud, um, they layered some kind of management layer on top of this form of um, servers, right? Um, they have the multi-tenancy, they have the self-service aspect of it and the scale-out architecture of it. Um, so the older paradigm is there, you have a backup administrator who knows every application out there and knows how to backup and restore that doesn't really work with the cloud. Cloud is more about self-provisioning. So if I want to provision 10 applications, I'll go and provision, right? I'll, I'll manage everything. There is no central administrator who basically helped me provision the resources that I needed for my application deployment. It just happens, right? Um, and the backup has to uh, flow into the same paradigm, right? There is no central administrator. And um, so, that we always put the platform first, 
right we want to make sure that this this functionality flows with the platform without adding additional friction with the deployment for the use and management none right it looks like very native to uh, to the platform that you are you're you are working on so um that's been our mantra or like foundational piece or theme um for our company right we started that with openstack uh, we are the first um, backup as a service true backup as a service that is self service multi tenant into the openstack cloud um and then when when we are looking at the cloud native the kubernetes we still want to stick to that same paradigm so we could take whatever we developed for openstack somehow retrofit into the kubernetes world but we didn't do that um because again the same thing right platform first um so if someone is using kubectl to manage their workloads provisioning and uh, managing their they should still use the kubectl to manage their backups that is our our theme and you know, you know, that is the reason that is the reason why we went and developed this from ground up right it looks natively built and uh, it it provides all the ease of use for the end customer okay you know you mentioned openstack it just it, i just had flashbacks i mean uh, like i said i've been here for a little while i remember when i remember when openstack was the shiny object and there was the uh, you know they started the what was it called the OpenStack summits and they were all right. they were up in Portland. I remember going up to Portland and the amount of Portland. the amount of, of hype and excitement and energy on those show floors when you were walking around there yeah. of everyone you know this is the next the next <laughs> big thing for computing. This is the next paradigm shift of you know distributed computing. And then six years later, it just seems it's kind of been more niche into like the telco yes. type space yes. and and then all of a sudden kubernetes is here and it's the yeah. same thing and now now you go to uh you know you go to kubecon well i guess we didn't get to go to the one in uh yeah there was this amsterdam right but i mean it was going to be amsterdam. we were really ratcheting up for that one so i don't think we're going to see kubernetes going away anytime soon i, I think i think it's here to stay and and you know is the key component for orchestration in a in a hybrid world. Um, when you said you got your first customer, what was it that they said? Okay, you know we want to we want to go with you. Like why did they select Trilio? As you know, it, it's hard. I mean, I remember being at Red Hat when we first started here. I I started in two thousand one, I think, and you know going in there, you had to sell the customers not on your company or on your product, but we had to sell open source and that we weren't, that we weren't wearing skateboard, we weren't have blue hair and, and, and skateboards. And, <laughs> you know, we, we had a lot of rep turnover back then because, you know, right. we were trying to convince people that open source was a good model as opposed to why they should be buying our product. So right. how was it when you, when you got your first deal? What, what were the challenges yeah. that you had with them? Right, that, that that was a very interesting story. Um, so uh, we were given the opportunity to, to present our so solution with uh, one of the biggest uh, telecommunications in US. Um, there was a three day backup there and all the vendors are presenting. Um, and we were the last one to go on the third day, <laughs> on the last day uh, to present our solution. Um, we don't have any brand recognition, nothing, right? Um, so we did we did go there and uh, we did present as a as a natively built OpenStack solution that adhered to all the OpenStack principles, um, the the scale and the multi tenancy and uh, and integration with the Keystone and everything. Um, so the guy um, stopped our stopped my presentation two slides into it and. Uh, and then said, "You are in." <laughs> what? He didn't even he didn't even let you finish with death by PowerPoint. No, no. And uh, and he basically turned to his rep and said, "This is exactly what I've been asking for." And all the vendors are presenting how good they are with the virtualization, and doing it for OpenStack is going to be nothing, right? They can do it, but no one presented the vision that we have. And frankly. We didn't have a GA product at the time. We were at the beta, but they are willing to risk, take a risk with us, saying that because our vision uh, is aligned with what they wanted to do. What's the what's the saying? Fake it till you make it. 
<laughs> well, the vision is important to where we are where you, where where we are taking the company, and that perfectly aligned with what they want to do with the OpenStack, rolling out a cloud um, for the entire enterprise. Okay, and I know that we are going to have a, a technical demonstration. Uh, Prashanto is going to be putting that on. Um, before we get it in, before we got into that, I, I did want to just talk about your 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 company and your operator for a second. You know, we invest a lot of time and energy working with software companies like yourselves. Um, you folks have a Red Hat certified container that's that's you know certified and, and fully supportable for use with Red Hat products. Do you have a, a an operator as well? Yeah, we our, our offering is fully certified and available in the operator hub and uh, i think we've been doing it since day one right our, starting with v1 product and we regularly update um, our operator in the operator hub so the latest version that is available is 202 uh, which was released last week okay cool and if um if you're not there already i'm also involved with the marketing for the uh, red hat marketplace operated by ibm if you're not connected with them already, we'd love to have you talk with them about having your your um, your backup solutions available in the marketplace. I don't know if it's there yet or if you're having that conversation. Uh, we know we have it in the IBM marketplace. Uh, Prashanta is the Red yes, Hat so, marketplace. Is yeah, we, we are in the Red Hat marketplace and the IBM marketplace already, Michael. Okay. So we've oh, okay, done good. gone through all those pieces and make sure we're there. Okay, great. Uh, so why should cloud architects, backup admins, and developers look at data protection? I mean, it, it you know this is this is obviously a question that we that we have scripted here to to get yeah. the, the dialogue going. To me, it sounds pretty straightforward that of course yeah. cloud architects, backup admins, and developers should be concerned about about Kubernetes. But you know, in your own words, yeah, uh, yeah I, I think you know th this is where we need to look. Um, the backup and recovery beyond just backing up few files and when is needed, like you recover those things. Um, uh, we 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 want to elevate the conversation of the backup um, in a bigger scale, especially in the cloud native. Uh, with the Kubernetes being the cloud platform um, you know, where you can write your application once and then run anywhere, right? That paradigm. You can do that with the DevOps. So you can create your application, orchestrate your application, and then spin as many instances as you want and any cloud you want it. But the challenge is the data. So if you have a data heavy application that is running on, on, on the Kubernetes and uh, for various operations reasons, you want to migrate the application to a different cloud, right? Um, especially in a multi-cloud scenario, that will happen. Every business should be looking at um, how they can they can have this multi-cloud strategy. Um, so the, the challenge is how you can move this application between the cloud transparently. All right. Um, so backup can capture the application and then record the application. So we want to elevate the discussion and uh, make it almost um, the must have uh, uh, the functionality in a multi-cloud scenario. So that way you can back up the applications, you can recover the applications on a different cloud for DR purposes, for other purposes. You can migrate the applications for cost savings, um, right, uh, for compliance reasons. So you can you, you can realize a lot more um, use cases um, if you make the cent the backup as central theme for your multi-cloud strategy, right? right? So as you can see, like you can, you, it, it plays much bigger role um, in your uh, in your IT. And I would like to throw out there that we are live right now. So like, hello, Facebook, hello, um, YouTube, hello, Twitch. If you folks are watching um, on any of those live streams, uh, if you post any questions into the chats over there, our producers will pick them up and we'll get them over here and we'll be sure to address any and all questions that you folks may have. Um, Prashanto, a little bit about yourself. You're the director of product. Um, what does that mean? What do you do? How terrific are you? Were, were you the, you know, were, were you the founder of Google before coming here to Trilio? I wish. He's a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> no, Muli's being kind, but uh, 
Yeah, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm the director of product for the Kubernetes offering at uh, Trillio. So I deal with all things Kubernetes in general. Uh, you know, looking at it uh, right from the business angle. Uh, you know, looking at the market drivers, looking at you know requirement generation. Um, you know, helping with go-to-market strategies. Uh, you know, engineering architectural discussions, everything. So. Uh, my focus is in terms of uh, building, developing, and uh, you know, selling the product, and that's what my day-to-day -day job entails. Um, before this, I was at uh, you know at uh, bigger uh, corporations where I was running uh, engineering as well as product management uh, teams, and uh, you know when I learned about. Uh, uh, learned about Trillio Vault for Kubernetes and the venture that uh, Murli was getting into. I was immediately attracted to it and uh, definitely wanted to be part of it. And uh, you know, after a few talking sessions, I was happy to be at Trillio and you know, we are heading this uh, next gen technology. Okay. What about some war stories? Um, we generally like to hear, you know, some aha moments or, you know, some type of interesting war story from, you know, deals lost, deals won, um, things that, that, that you want to share with, with our viewers. And then that could be either for yourself or, or Murali. I just, you happen mm -hmm. to have this, have to have the stage right now. I'd say, uh, from, a from aha moments, uh, you know, when we went down, you know, initially how we built our product was more uh, in terms of applications that were being run within Kubernetes. So, you know, people were running operator-based application, helm-based applications, and, you know, they were deploying applications based on labels and so on. So our focus was in terms of protecting a helm chart, basically an operator, uh, operator piece of the application as well as the application controlled by the operator and so on. And uh, what happened is, you know, eventually talking with customers, what we realized is, you know, there is a good population of customers who, because of the lack of, uh, you know, proper definition of an application within Kubernetes, they were using namespaces as the boundaries or as their definition or their scope for an application. There was a one-to-one -one mapping between a namespace and an application. So uh, immediately we realized that, and uh, you know that was one of the biggest uh, value adds that we added into the product was a namespace level backup and recovery feature, which is you know very very uh, well appreciated by customers today, and is uh, you know along with the helm and operator pieces, uh, you know they end up using the namespace backup recovery protocol and the procedure a lot more as well. So helm chart versus say like a level four operator. I know internally at Red Hat, we have a, a large technical team that works with software vendors to, you know, run their, 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 their operator through our test certification suite. And so it's Red Hat certified. I'm very familiar that, that like building a Helm chart is, is, is easy, but making an operator is more challenging. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, with an operator, it's almost, uh... You know, not almost, it's pretty much developing two applications together. You have the operator based application and then the application that the operator is controlling and managing in a way. Uh, so, the way we have uh, looked at the uh, look, looked at the landscape, then we realized that, you know, in order to provide customers the best feel and approach for managing their Kubernetes environment, simplifying the Kubernetes infrastructure for them, operators was the best way forward for us. Um, so what we've done is we have adhered and adopted the OLM framework for operators from Red Hat and supported a operator for OpenShift directly through OLM. And then via Helm, we have an upstream operator as well, which can be deployed in upstream environments. Okay. Um, maybe Morali, maybe let's, let's go back to you. Um, what are the required principles behind a cloud native architecture for data protection and management? Uh, I, I think software first. So um, we, this, the, one, one of the challenges is not to rely on any proprietary stuff, right? 
whether it's a backup format, because multi-cloud is the, must be the uh, main focus area. Um, so essentially what it means is your, if you, if your backup functionality is limiting um, you to uh, be mobile with your applications, uh, able to do basically mo move these applications from one cloud to other, then you should stay away from that backup, backup application. A um, lot of backup vendors, they go with uh, uh, very proprietary format because the storage savings that uh, they basically created an IP around it, they get it um, only when you save their backups on their appliance. But you can't move that appliance into the cloud, right? So um, we, we always start with, we never ever want to develop any proprietary technologies that, um, that basically prohibit our customers uh, to be completely nimble in a multi-cloud environment. So, uh, so ours is software only solution. Um, it doesn't rely on any of, any of the proprietary technologies and uh, it uses standard Linux based standards and the tools for creating backups uh, for whether it's a space savings or for all the functionality that, that people expect from backup vendors. But on top of it, we are very nimble. So you can take an application that is backed up from uh, say upstream Kubernetes, and then you are running OpenShift on AWS. You should be able to recover your application without losing anything uh, from our backup from our backups. Um, so that is the flexibility that we provide. And of, of course, we talked about the native integration be part of the platform itself. Um, so that also gives us a lot more uh, flexibility um, because we can. And we do discover all the applications running in the Kubernetes and, and provide a one snapshot view to the end user, what applications are protected, what applications are not protected, kind of gives a uh, risk profile for the end user, like if there is an exposure for the applications, because we have a good integration with the platform, so we can do provide that kind of analytics to the end user. You can see that uh, in uh, Prashanto's demo when, he de when you go to the demo. Okay. Fair enough. So how's business? I We're know, doing very good. I, I know that, uh, you know, when, when, when uh, this whole challenging time thing started, um, we were like, oh my gosh, like I haven't, I haven't been on an airplane in a year. Not, not, <laughs> that, not that this is necessarily tied to our business, but I was wondering about, you know, like our account managers the the lack of traveling on site and what that would do right. to slowing down sales, but I think everyone's adopted to working virtually. Absolutely. These days, um, but outside of just you know these challenging times, right? How how is your business trending as far as adoption and growth and and so forth? Well, I think we we've been doing very good. I you know. Um, of course, like any other company, we need to adapt, change. And um, I can talk talk about Justin and our marketing. Like he had so many plans laid out for 2020, <laughs> and then he has to uh, change them to adapt to the COVID times. Um, uh, uh, we we did not miss a beat. I think uh, we we did uh, very well in 2020 in terms of a uh, number of uh, new customers that we signed up. Um, and uh, the number of products and the releases that we rolled out, even though everyone is working remote. Um, yeah, I, I think I think we did very well. That's good. Um, okay, so just let's talk about the the key use cases that the customers are looking to solve, and then I think we'll mm -hmm. we'll, we'll switch and get more into an actual uh, hands on technical demo of it. But can you talk about the the customer use cases? Uh, yeah, I think we, we we focus on four use cases with our solution, right? Um, they look almost similar, but of course, backup and recovery, right? If something bad happens, you, user should have a way to go and backup and recovery. And in a, in a multi-cloud environment, our focus area will be multi-cloud because that is going to be the standard. So when you say multi-cloud, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, between AWS and Azure or, uh, or VMware and Azure. It could be like multiple Kubernetes clusters that are running on-prem that can be multi-cloud too, because they are two different platforms. And uh, you need to have something that tie all these uh, cloud, all these clusters together to provide that unified view and then provide these interesting use cases. And uh, so application mobility and the migration is under, uh, under big use case that we are solving, uh, we, we address. And the other one is the disaster recovery. 
disaster recovery for the applications. Um, if something bad happens on the production side, how quickly you can recover that application onto the remote side. Um, so the DR. So these are the four four use cases that we focus on with our solution. Okay. Shanto, how about over to you? I think you prepared something here for us today. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, what I'll do is I'll share my screen and you can let me know once you can see it. So what's the, what's the before you get started, what's the over under, um, Morali? What's the over under on um, whether or not his demo is going to uh, hang? Uh, throw out some bugs which he fixes uncomfortably in front of everybody or goes flawlessly because it's been pre-recorded? I, I think it, it, it goes flawlessly. I know Prashant I, though, and I know I, our technology. I did it a uh, very... <laughs> 20, 22 years ago, I was working for this company called Mission Critical Linux, and we it was before <laughs> Red Hat bought us. And I was flying around the world with Intel because we had a really interesting workload that ran on Itanium. Uh, remember the Itanium systems? Yeah, These yeah. giant, enormous, you know, the predecessor to x86-64. And I was on stage, and this is the reason why I asked um, uh, Prashanto, is I'm on stage with this, with the uh, fellow, uh, um, Will Swope, I think was his name, and we're just about getting ready to go the, do the demo. There was like two big racks, and then there was a client that was going to run an app, and we're going to fail it over between the nodes. And it had a memory leak in it. And so because I staged it behind behind scenes, while while we're waiting for me to go on, the memory just started leaking, 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 wow. leaking. And so they announced me on stage. I go up there, and the client is just like completely dead. And it was the most embarrassing demo I've ever had to do in my entire life. And after oh, wow. that, after that, and it was, this was like big, it was like Linux world, right? It was like right. 15,000 people in the audience or something. Wow. Yeah. So after that, I, I can everything. <laughs> I just, yeah. I don't think we have 15,000 people here today, but sorry. A little, yeah, yeah. little less risk here on the OpenShift <laughs> Live demos are always risky. Exactly. Um, yeah, hopefully the demo builds are with me. So let's see how that goes. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming everyone can see my screen. The, you can see the OpenShift uh, console. Yes, and you see this is exactly why we're having these T-shirts made. And we are going to get some shipped out to you. We make okay. no joke. Cyrus and I were designing the last <laughs> night. We're gonna have we're gonna have twelve hundred made that say, "Can you see my screen?" and twelve hundred made that say, "You're on mute." And we're gonna you guys can be our first recipient, and you'll get one of each, and then you mm -hmm. can wear them during all of your Zoom meetings, and you can just point, "Hey, you're on this mute," one, or "Can you see my screen?" And the same thing goes for anyone who's uh, watching us right now on Facebook or YouTube. If anyone wants to get one of these uh, limited edition, can you see my screen, Red Hat t-shirts, uh, send me an email. It's just uh, wait at redhat.com and we'll hook you up. Um, over to you, Prashant, though. Great, thank you, Michael. So what we see in front of us right now is the uh, OpenShift console. Uh, this is a OpenShift 4.6 environment, which is running in AWS. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the operator hub over here. Operator hub, as we all know, is like the marketplace for deploying applications into an OpenShift environment. I'll search for Trilio. Right now, we are available in the marketplace, and uh, you see a couple of other tiles. Uh, one of the tiles is the official 2.0.2 version, and the other tile is a custom version that I was using for testing. But uh, this is the custom version. Uh, it's a 0 0.5.7 version, and this is the one which is actually installed. Um, as you can see from a capability perspective, uh, you know we support full lifecycle upgrades, uh, you know, patching everything uh, for the operator itself. It is a certified product. Um, you know, we provide additional information around uh, how to learn more about the product. There are live labs and so on, licensing information. Uh, from a licensing perspective, there is a 30-day free trial or a 10-node basic edition that we provide uh, 
uh, for free and uh, folks can get uh, jump started with the technology very, very quickly. So uh, overall, this takes about uh, three clicks. You know, you go into the operator hub, search for Trello, click on the tile, uh, click on install, and uh, you know, within a matter of five minutes, you have Trello up and running within your environment. Since it's already installed over here, uh, we'll go and take a look at how it uh, all appears. Now, one of the things, you know, when we were talking about the Helm and the operator uh, piece, you know, we could have just developed everything as a Helm chart itself. But what we've uh, done is we've followed an operator model because we realized that we can have uh, very, very much of a service oriented architecture by going via the uh, operator model. And what we've done over here is if you see, each of these styles represent a custom resource definition for Trillium. So we have a custom resource definition for a license, uh, for creating the backup repository, which we call a target, for creating policies, uh, you know, scheduling policies, retention policies, for uh, supporting hooks. Hooks are uh, injection points within an application that you would run to Wires the application and get it to a consistent state before taking a backup. Um, we have a TRD known as the backup plan, which is basically the protection scope that a user defines for what they want to protect. It can be just a helm chart. It can be a helm chart and an operator-based application. It can be a namespace, or it can be a combination of any of those items. So whatever the user wants to protect, he can define that within this uh, entity or within this resource known as backup plan. And then finally, we have uh, the backup and the restore operations, which basically enable the backup and restore activities. So overall, if you see, what we've done is we've modularly built the product based on the operations and based on the activities that end users would want to do. Now, the value in doing it this way is the fact that because each of these operations is a modular operation, you can apply Kubernetes RBAC, which we directly plug into, on each of these items. So for example, Michael, let's assume you were the administrator and uh, you had control over all the storage resources. Now, you would not want any of the developers in the organizations to create targets. So you can specifically make sure that the target custom resource definition is available only to you for uh, use. So you can create the targets, but all the other folks within your organization can leverage that target for use for storing their backups. So, and the entire product, whether it's, you know, hooks, policies, backup plan, backup restore, any of these activities can be granularly uh, segmented based on a user's role and scope. Uh, and any questions on that, Michael, based on how we have architected the product and how it looks and appears as an operator over here? No, not, not, none at all. I think it looks really nice. Awesome. So right now uh, in this environment, I just applied a license here yesterday. Uh, it's the free license that we are using. It's all active. Uh, from a target perspective, we have uh, two targets available over here. And uh, similarly, from a policy hooks, there are a few items that are created everywhere. And uh, I'll go through it again. But uh, overall, the way a user would want to use uh, these different tabs over here is by clicking on Create Target. They have the option of you know, either using a YAML view. We have the entire instructions on how to use the YAML on the right-hand side uh, panel. Or if they do not want to use the YAML view, they can use a form-based approach, which uh, Open, uh, OpenShift provides, and we directly plug into it. So we have uh, addressed and adhered to the framework for these dynamic forms. And because of that, our entire YAML specification files are available as a click-driven or you know, a simple form-based approach if users are not uh, you know, familiar with the YAML approach or do not like the YAML approach, I know developers would end up using the YAML approach. But in case you want to use the form view, you have that as well. Now, as I said, we have a few targets created over here. Uh, from a policy perspective, we have some policies created based on retention. We don't have any hooks. 
uh, for the backup plan. Uh, as you see, there are a bunch of different backup plans that are running in this uh, environment associated with different protection scopes. And just to kind of show you how that works, uh, we just call this OpenShift TV. Uh, backup namespace, we call this a namespace that we had called Storm App. And from a backup config perspective, I'm going to use one of the buckets that I already have created. So once you provide all this information, you go ahead and click Create. This will go ahead and start creating the backup plan. And once it validates, the controllers will validate that whatever I've asked for it to backup is actually correct and will put it into an available state. Uh, beyond that, a user would come into the backup menu. They create backup. Let's call this shift TV and give them a backup. Not giving any labels over here. Backup type, we do a full backup. And the backup plan name will be shift. Okay. There are other informations around API version, everything if you want to provide that, not necessary. And we can go ahead and create this. So what happens is once we trigger this uh, backup, which is right here, OpenShift TV backup, it will go through the Trilio process of, uh, you know, snapping the metadata objects, so all the uh, manifest files that comprise of the application, we protect that first, and then we get into the data components of capturing the persistent volumes and so on. So it's a pretty much sequential step, step-by-step uh, -step process, uh, which would take, uh, for this, this operation, I expect it to take about five to six minutes uh, overall. But in the end, it would depend upon uh, you know how big your persistent volumes are whenever you're doing a backup. But that's overall you know how you end up doing a backup from OpenShift for any of your applications running anywhere within the cluster. So I, and then, I have a couple. I have a couple sure. of questions, if I may. I, I didn't want to interrupt you right right in the middle, but mm -hmm. you know, it, you you reference at the top that this is for Kubernetes. So mm -hmm. does this work with any flavor of Kubernetes? Like, do you see, do you see people using community supported Kubernetes inside their environments and they're asking you to, to back up and given the, the, the fast change rate in Kubernetes development by itself, how does your product keep up with all the changes that are, that are coming along? So, uh, yes. So what, uh... To answer your first, the first part of your question, we have developed uh, the product as a Kubernetes native solution. So it will work in any distribution that is uh, CNCF certified. Uh, so that's how we've constructed the product, making it you know very seamless for any Kubernetes environment to deploy and use this. And then uh, because we are you know, leveraging the Kubernetes constructs, you know, we are leveraging all the abstractions that Kubernetes provides. Uh, maintenance and upkeep becomes pretty easy for us because, you know, we are using firstly one of the, or one of, but more of the basic level components that Kubernetes offers. So those components do not change as much or you know, barely change. And then there is backwards compatibility provided to the Kubernetes system itself that makes the churn on our end very minimal. So from that angle, you know, all the abstractions to hook into the Kubernetes system, the, you know, compatibility, the, uh, all, all these different pieces help us in, you know, pushing out code really, really fast. So one of the things uh, that we've been doing on average is we've been doing new releases, uh, you know, with cutting edge features uh, almost about every couple of months. And uh, you know, we've, we've seen things or I've done things in the past, you know, not Kubernetes centric and I've seen how long driven and uh, you know, how long those cycles can be, but Kubernetes and all these different uh, newer technologies are changing the way we do things. And we are, you know, while we are building a product for Kubernetes, uh, we ourselves are realizing the benefits that it provides internally for us. Okay. And what about, what about workloads? Are there are there some apps that um, 
Trulio Vault works better with because of the way they're architected, or or what if, what if someone what if someone is using an app that's not cloud native and they they sort of did a forklift, you know, uh, jam into the cloud? Is, is does that pose any problems, or do, does your does your backup solution work best or work only for an app that's cloud native? So right now, if your if your application is a Kubernetes based application, we can protect it via the Kubernetes solution. Obviously, if you have a you know like a more of a traditional VM based uh, solution, then we have our other products around Rev and OpenStack as well that can support that. But uh, each product is specific for those domains, and uh, you know future consolidation is something that we have thought of. But uh, it's kind of down the road now. Okay, and what about? So I was just <clears throat> I was just on a call before we were with you. We were talking with um, with one of the modern cloud native uh, SQL database vendors out mm -hmm. there, and they they're you know they're running in a very distributed node uh, manner. Um, what's the magic? How does it how does it work in 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 plain people speak maybe for doing you know backup or data management when you have these nodes that are distributed you know and like say you take an OpenShift cluster that runs on public cloud and private cloud and on premise and you know is there any special sauce or magic that would that is required to have Trilio Vault be able to address the the data management needs in such a distributed model? Exactly. So the the secret sauce, or the way we do it, is through hooks. You know, uh, we can basically inject commands before a backup happens, and you know, after a backup happens, uh, directly within the container itself. So, is there if there is any kind of uh, management activities or pre work that is required for us to perform the backup, uh, or for the application to get a consistent uh, backup, we end up doing those through hooks. And what we've also done is if I take you to our... So, if I can interrupt Prashant. So the other Probably. aspect, of my, Mike, in that, in that is obviously application discovery, right? Um, when you look at this complex application where um, you have multiple nodes, some of them local, some of them remote, um, the thing that is tying the entire application is how they roll out the application. It could be an operator-based application or it could be a Helm-based application, right? Um, so, you know, you need to have a backup policy that operates at that abstraction that the developer intended to. Like, if they are rolling out a Helm-based release, um, the backup need to run at that level, not nodes or not PVs or not uh, containers level, um, or the operator. So, uh, I think we are the only backup solution out there that can operate at that operator or Helm level where we auto discover all the components of that application, including the PVs and the containers and secrets and the config. And um, we can we can back up the application as they are laid out, as it is laid out. And, and I'll say if the application has basically grown into more number of PVs, we automatically discover that and the next backup will include all those things. We preserve that application nature um, and these are the hooks are essentially provide the application consistent backups for you. Sure. What did he do, so, Prashanto? Good, yeah. good. Did he sign yeah. off on that? Yes, yes, totally. <laughs> uh, Murli has the higher authority on this. <laughs> but uh, but uh, what I wanted to show you was, uh, you know, we have uh, you know tested, validated, and we do support uh, you know multiple applications that have this distributed nature like Cassandra and so on. Uh, we provide the backup plans and the hooks that we've tested with, you know, as our hooks kind of show you what is the hook you want to execute, which is the pod that you want to execute it against. Is there any kind of specific container you want to run this uh, within? So, you know, you have a lot of granular control to make sure that you can talk to the application in the right fashion to get it into a state that you can perform the perfect backup or the consistent backup that you need, which would be both. So you, in, in your hooks there, you specifically have hooks for Cassandra, hooks for Mongo, hooks for Mar MariahDB. Do those come 
already or do those have to be pre-configured or you know do, you, do they have to be created by the end users when they first get this going and the reason why i ask is i'm, I'm more concerned about uh transactional databases like sql in nature like um like a like a yugabyte or um fauna db i think they just added sql functionality or uh what's the other like cockroach cockroach db like those those the, those are the ones that i see are going to start displacing transactional databases traditionally from like an oracle or a db2 correct so so yes one of the things uh, we provide these uh book examples as you know uh, templates for customers to leverage within their own environment obviously they can tweak them further to match it exactly to how they are running their applications but uh, you know following the kind of 80 20 principle this would get them to 80 percent of the level there and if there is any additional nuances or patches required on top of that they can obviously uh, you know do it on top right now we support you know a bunch of different applications uh, there are a few, not few, a lot more that are on the, uh, you know, on the bandwagon for things to complete. And you will see things like, you know, time series database, NoDB, InfluxDB, uh, you know, Prometheus uh, related databases and so on being added here in the upcoming weeks as well. And uh, uh, there was a second part to your question, right, Michael? Uh, there, there was a second part but I do want to make sure we're cognizant of the time here. Mm -hmm. um, so we probably oh, got yeah. about two, we got about two minutes left to address the second part. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the second part of your question was around, uh, um, I believe you were talking about uh, these examples itself, right? And uh, yeah, so, uh, so as I said, right, these are different uh, application-based hooks that we are providing. They're constantly being updated. Uh, you know, we test them out internally. They are provided as a you know template for everyone to use, and we'll continue building these over and over again. And whatever the new applications that we see demand from customers, they will be added here as you know a proof point that this works, and we've tested and validated it as well. Um, I, I talk with. I, the the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I talk mm -hmm. with customers all the time. And this morning I was, I was on with our entire financial services sales leadership team, and and they identified one of their key workloads as being these transactional uh, SQL databases for DB2 and Oracle offload. Um, mm -hmm. So you might want to take a look at uh, throwing putting adding some support in there for those right out of the box. Definitely, definitely do. Uh, so we have a couple minutes left here. I wanted to, to get back out and talk with uh, Morali about, um, you know, where do you see this going in 18 to 24 months from now? Is, is, are we there? I mean, have, has the eagle landed or is this just the beginning? No, this is just the beginning. I, there, there is so much that we need to do here, right? Um, uh, you know, you, you can see the Kubernetes is going to be the pretty much standard in a cloud environment uh, as a platform of choice. Um, and people are also calling it a platform of platforms, right? Now you can see Red Hat is bringing the virtualization technology to the Kubernetes with a Kubeboard. And uh, we want to extend our support to Kubeboard. Um, you know, and then there are other distros in the platform that we need to qualify, including uh, VMware Tanzu and uh, anything that oh. is happening in the <laughs> VMware, <who>? <laughs> anything, <laughs> anything that's happening in the public cloud, right? Um, so the, we, we, the, the, this, this is this is a big play. Uh, Kubernetes is is enormous, and uh, we want to be there um, in every every part of it. Um, and also, you know, that's on the platform side, but also the features. We need to keep up with the features, and be ransomware is one of the biggest threat. Um, and uh, we strongly believe the backup play a vital role um, in in protecting against uh, uh, ransomware threats. So we are closely looking at some of the standards like NIST uh, uh, cybersecurity framework and uh, how we can be part of um, part of in part of that that bigger picture. Um, and uh, looking at uh, additional use case in the multi-cloud uh, environments. And then also public cloud. So no, the, we, we Eagle hasn't landed. He hasn't. So uh, I think uh, 
uh, we are so excited about um, what what the future holds for us for this year and next year. Um, okay, anything that you know when we're done here and you get that call from Justin, who's your your VP of you know biz dev and and, and marketing and and you know what 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 how do we stop that call from him that says, Morali, I can't believe you didn't talk about this one thing. It's this we talked about this. Like what would that be? Uh, he wanted. To he wanted me to talk a lot of things um <laughs> well, given that we i think, have I think one... we covered <laughs> um we covered everything pretty well i think i um i think uh, yeah i think we are good uh what did i not talk um do you want to talk about the management console that we built something around that yeah management console we have management console um, we have a lot of good partnerships going on with um, uh, with, things, with with a lot of uh, backup vendors and other other people. Like um, you know, we recently announced uh, a partnership with Veritas, um, which is big for us. Um, it validates our vision uh, in the cloud marketplace. That is one thing that Justin uh, want me to talk about. Yeah, that's pretty much it, um, Mike. I'm gonna now go for my 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 clunky. Uh, uh, slideshow. Start from the current. So, can you see my screen? I hope you can. Um, this is the call to action part of it. Uh, if you want to see it in action, you can follow the link on here. Um, they have demos, they have labs, and certainly, if anyone needs to get in con in contact with them, you can see Prashanto's contact information on the bottom left. Or you could always send me an email. I, I know these folks really well, and frankly, I know just about every software company fairly well, so it's just wait at redhat.com. Um, Morali Prashanto, thank you for joining us here today. This was this was great having you folks on the show. Yeah, thank you for having us. Uh, Mike it's, and Chris, it's been yeah. great. Super okay. exciting, thank you.